Hello, hello. Welcome back to the Straight A Nursing Podcast. I am Nurse Mo, and as always, really happy that we're hanging out studying together today. In just a moment, we'll be diving into a maternal newborn topic of neonatal abstinence syndrome. Now, before we do that, I want to take a quick minute for a listener shout out. And this one goes to Kayla, who says this. Thank you, Nurse Mo. You have saved my nursing school career. I was about to quit nursing school a year ago when I failed my med surge one course by one point. I was so down. I turned on your podcast and I found an episode about encouragement during nursing school and it brought me out of my funk. I started listening to your podcast for every exam and to keep myself in the mind of a nurse during the summers. I'm in my last semester now and just passed my cardiac med surge 2 exam with a 90%. Thank you so much. You rescued me from failing nursing school. Kayla, wow, thank you so much for writing in and sharing that. And way to go for getting back on the saddle and absolutely crushing your med surge 2 exam. That is awesome. And I'm just thrilled to have played even a tiny tiny part in all of that. So if you are also thinking, hey, I could use some encouragement in nursing school, I believe that the episode Kayla is referencing is episode 126. And the title of that episode is The Ultimate Nursing School Pep Talk. So you can bookmark that one, save it and listen to it whenever you need a little bit of a boost. Okay, so we are diving into neonatal abstinence syndrome, sometimes just referred to as NAS. And this is a condition that occurs when neonates who were exposed to drugs in utero experience withdrawal after they're born. Now, most of the data around NAS focuses on the use of opioids, but there are some other common drugs that can lead to NAS, such as SSRIs, those antidepressants, barbiturates, and benzodiazepines. So all of these substances can pass through the placenta, get into the neonatal circulation, causing dependency and ultimately withdrawal symptoms in the newborn. Now, according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, an infant is diagnosed with NAS every 15 minutes in the United States. Non-Hispanic white infants are at the highest risk for NAS, with males tending to have increased severity of symptoms. All infants born to mothers who use opioids or other culprit substances are at risk, though not all opioid-exposed newborns will have symptoms, but pretty much most of them do. So let's talk a bit about the complications of neonatal abstinence syndrome. So it's more, so much more than the unpleasant symptoms that the neonate experiences, and the complications can be significant. The most serious complication is sudden infant death syndrome, which is the primary cause of mortality, especially in cocaine use, opioid use, and polysubstance use. Other complications and comorbidities include low birth weight and preterm birth, poor feeding and weight loss, transient tachypnea of the newborn, or TTN, as well as other respiratory complications, meconium aspiration syndrome, jaundice, seizures, and visual disturbances like strabismus, nystagmus, and lower visual acuity dysregulation of behavioral systems, developmental delays, learning difficulties and behavioral issues, and longer hospital stays. So now that you've got a little bit of an overview of NAS, let's dive into caring for these patients using the straight A nursing latte method. So L is for look How does the patient look? So an infant experiencing NAS can display a wide variety of symptoms depending on the type of opioid used or the type of substance used, timing of the last dose, 
polysubstance use, that definitely plays a factor, maternal metabolism, and the infant's metabolism. So a large group of symptoms are related to CNS disturbances, and these are high-pitched cry, tremors, poor sleep, irritability, increased muscle tone, myoclonic jerks, convulsions, and a hyperactive Moro reflex. So the Moro reflex is also sometimes called a startle reflex, and this is in response to sudden stimulation or a sudden lack of support, and it involves the infant extending the arms and the neck and then pulling the arms in. So those CNS disturbances were high-pitched cry, tremors, poor sleep, irritability, increased muscle tone, myoclonic jerks, convulsions, and that hyperactive Moro reflex. And then GI disturbances could be poor feeding and poor suck. Regurgitation, vomiting could even be present, and the baby may have loose and watery stools. For respiratory disturbances, tachypnea is common, nasal stuffiness, sneezing, and nasal flaring. And then some other ones are sweating, fever, weight loss, the skin could be mottled, and they could have excoriation. And often this excoriation is on the chin, the nose, and the cheeks due to the infant clawing at their little face. So now let's talk about assessment. How do we assess an infant with NAS? So a key component of your assessment is NAS scoring, and this is often done with the Finnegan Neonatal Abstinence Scale. So this is a scoring tool that assigns points to the 21 most common symptoms, and most of which I mentioned just a moment ago. Now, if the baby has a score of seven or less, this typically indicates that we don't need to use pharmacology to help them manage their symptoms. If it's higher than that, then we start looking at pharmacology with the goal of not using it unless we absolutely need it. So scoring is conducted routinely, often every three to four hours during the infant's hospital stay and anytime there's a change in behavior or a change in the infant's treatment. So when using the Finnegan scale, do so with the knowledge that this is, of course, a very subjective assessment, which could lead to over or under medicating the infant. It's a good idea to periodically have another nurse perform the assessment to help ensure that you're seeing the same things they're seeing, and this helps increase reliability of the scoring. Another assessment framework is part of the Eat Sleep Console method, and we'll discuss this method when we get into treatments. But basically, what we're doing here is we're assessing if the infant is able to eat an appropriate amount. We'll assess their sleep habits. The infant should stay asleep for a minimum of one hour after feeding, and we'll assess the infant's ability to be consoled within 10 minutes. And then other key assessments include intake and output, weighing the infant to assess for weight loss, assessing for dehydration secondary to poor intake, vomiting, and those watery stools, and monitoring for complications such as respiratory distress and seizures. So the next letter in the LATTE method is a T, and it stands for TESTS. So what tests are going to be utilized? Now, there's not a specific diagnostic test for NAS. It's diagnosed based on the maternal history and then ruling out other possible causes for the infant symptoms. So if NAS is suspected, maternal and infant toxicology tests may be conducted. Note that a negative test does not always rule out NAS because the opioid may have already cleared the system. Now, the next letter in the latte method is a T for treatments, what treatments are provided for NAS. So the treatments for this condition are going to be guided by scoring and continuous assessment of the infant's symptom severity. So one such treatment modality is eat, sleep, console. This family-centered approach starts with non-pharmacologic treatments of feeding the infant on demand, 
consoling the child when they are irritable, and letting them sleep between feedings as much as possible. If these interventions are ineffective, then pharmacological interventions are utilized. Benefits of eat, sleep, console over other treatments are shorter NICU stays, less use of pharmacologic agents, lower treatment costs, and more family involvement in the care of the infant. Now, of course, you could also use that Finnegan scale to determine if pharmacologic treatment is warranted. So you might be using Eat Sleep Console, you might be using Finnegan, maybe a combination of both. But the medications utilized for NAS include morphine, methadone, buprenorphine, clonidine, and phenobarbital. And which medication is used will depend a lot on the severity of the infant's symptoms. Note that in most cases, the infant will be weaned off these medications prior to discharge. So they'll be given less and less and less of it over time to wean them off. In some cases, the infant could be discharged while still weaning. But for the most part, we definitely try to avoid that and try to get them completely weaned prior to discharge. Now, what about non-pharmacologic symptom management interventions? We want to maintain a neuro-friendly environment that includes dim lights and low noise. We want to swaddle the baby and provide gentle handling to avoid overstimulation. We can wake the infant gently to avoid startling and overstimulation. We want to support the infant's sleep after feeding. This may require holding the infant. Providing a pacifier can help. It gives the baby non-nutritive sucking opportunities. We can rock the infant and provide skin-to-skin contact. Other interventions may include IV hydration and nutritional supplementation with high-calorie formula if breastfeeding is not utilized or does not provide adequate calories. And then we get to the letter E, which is the final letter in the LATTE method, which stands for educate. So it's important to maintain a non-judgmental demeanor when caring for families of NAS infants and to provide education in a very open and honest manner. Some key elements of your teaching plan should include providing opioid use disorder resources to prevent instances of NAS with future pregnancies. You want to teach that breastfeeding is safe with maternal use of methadone and buprenorphine, which I have a hard time saying, buprenorphine. And make sure that you teach that breastfeeding should be avoided if the mother is continuing to use substances that could cause opioid dependency in the newborn. Ensure caregivers know how to provide nutrition to the infant if breastfeeding is not going to be utilized. You can also teach that NAS symptoms can persist or occur later. So ensure that caregivers know the potential signs and symptoms to watch for. Encourage the mother to seek prenatal care with future pregnancies and to discuss drug use with their physician. And you also want to teach that follow-up care is important to monitor for developmental delays in the child so that we can intervene where applicable and assess the ongoing health of the child. So there you have it, your short guide to neonatal abstinence syndrome. If you're not yet following the show, make sure you do that so you don't miss a single episode. And if you found this episode helpful, hey, why not share it with a friend? Sharing episodes helps get the word out, helps other students feel that same success that Kayla did, the student that I gave the shout out to at the beginning of this episode. So I will see you back here next week where we talk about electrolytes, which sometimes seems like the bane of every nursing student's existence. I'll break it down to some must-know information and share some really good news about the next generation NCLEX. See you then. This podcast is brought to you by Straight A Nursing. 